Hi everybody, my name is Eloise Matheson and today, I'll just wait a moment for the presentation, but I'd like to tell you a bit about the work I do which is robotics and specifically tele-robotics. I'm feeling the time pressure already. So I, I've put uh, as reference to Twitter our hashtag of our lab, which uh, I'm learning to tweet about now quite regularly. But um, I'm a YGT at Eztech, and oh, hang on, I have control here. Uh, what is a young graduate trainee? I think you've already uh, heard a little bit about it, but just to give you a quick introduction, it's basically an entry-level job at ESA where they try and give you exposure to what ESA does with the idea that you take that experience and bring it back to industry. So it's a placement of one year up to two years, and it's across all of ESA in all different fields. So for me, I'm a young graduate trainee from Britain, and I'm working in the robotics group at Eztech, which is a European Space Research and Technical Centre in the Netherlands. So specifically, I'm in the robotics and automation section. And in this section, we've got three labs. The first is planetary robotics, which focuses on rovers and the technology behind uh, what it takes to, to have a successful exploration rover on a different planet. There is the Orbital Mechanics Lab, which is just starting, and that's focusing on the interaction of robotics in orbit, say for space debris cleanup or satellite maintenance. And there's my lab, which is called Telerobotics and Haptics, and we focus on the interaction of humans and robots and how uh, we can use both to have a more successful operation in places which are difficult for humans to operate in, such as space, but you can also imagine that there's a lot of applications underwater or in a dangerous site, such as a nuclear uh, bunker. And I think we all remember Fukushima and how useful robotics would have been then and actually were. So, what do we do specifically? We do something which is called telecontrol of robots over a distance, but with haptics. And haptics is the sense of touch, so you can really feel what the robot feels. So the idea is that we keep the human in the loop, so the human can still make those high-level decisions that robots are at the moment unable to do. Robots are pretty intelligent and Autonomous robots are increasingly every, every year becoming more and more smart, but still they can't make the rapid real-time decisions that humans can. So what we want to do is uh, combine the, the best of both worlds. So we focus on robotics that uh, can perform tasks in a similar way to humans, but we also focus on the interface of the human to the robot. And generally that's through something like an exoskeleton. So there's uh, other systems, including visual systems, uh, for instance, 3D glasses or stereo, uh, stereo glasses you can wear. Uh, this particular video is an example of, you'll see the human operator soon, but it's a human operator wearing Oculus Rift glasses, so he can't actually see the robot, he just sees the feedback from those cameras on the cooker arm on the right. And with his arm, which is inside an exoskeleton, he's moving uh, the robot on the left in order to perform a task. So you can imagine that the operator is hundreds of kilometers away, safely, or inside a space station, and controlling a robot on the surface of a planet or uh, somewhere where we don't want the human to be. So one really interesting project that my lab is part of is called Meteoron, which is a multi-purpose end-to-end robotics operation network. And the idea of Meteoron is to a techno technological demonstration of telecontrol of robots from the ISS at the moment to ground, but we can imagine it might later be an orbiter of Mars to Mars or somewhere completely different. So it's a partnership with DLR, NASA and Roscosmos. And ESA, of course. So here we have uh, the first main uh, demonstration of Meteoron from our lab, which is called Haptics One. And Haptics One is basically the first force feedback joystick in space. So this is, this is actually at the moment on the ISS. So it's a one degree of freedom joystick, so basically push it forward and back, but you can feel whatever forces are applied in that direction. So an example here is the pictures are of the astronaut Barry Wilmore, an American astronaut, who is doing ground testing of the Haptics One device. And later on the right, this is him installing the device on the ISS, and this happened just after Christmas last year. And at the same time, we're doing more tests on the ground, so it's me on the left, sorry for the photo. But uh, we, at, with these sort of experiments, we're trying to understand if humans in space feel feedback differently to how they do on Earth. And actually, you can imagine it really is the case, because in space, you're weightless. So whatever force you put on yourself, you feel it in a different way to how you would on Earth. 
So it's interesting to see, and we do the test with the astronauts on space, but also on the ground, so we can compare their data. And there's two ways this experiment can take place, either body mounted, which is myself on the left, or it's mounted to the wall. So haptics two, or haptics one, sorry, will take, uh, it's nine different protocols. It's like playing a game almost with the tablet and the force feedback joystick, but it's just on the ISS. But haptics two, will involve an astronaut using that joystick to control another joystick on the ground. And this will be the first demonstration of force feedback telecontrol from somewhere in space to somewhere on Earth. And this should take place in about May this year. And so this will demonstrate uh, how an astronaut could possibly control a robot at a distance but with fine control because they can feel what the robot feels. So for instance, you can distinguish between if you're touching a hard object or a soft object, or you can feel if you're picking up an egg, you don't want to break it. And if, imagine if you're on Mars, if you do want to break a rock, you know exactly how much force to apply. But the problem, of course, with this operation is that you have a delay in the signal. So you might hit that rock and then a second or whatever it is later, you feel it. And by then you might have already broken your instrument. So on the same side, the robot itself needs to have some intelligence so we can make those decisions. I'm going to stop, wait for my next command before I break myself, as an example. So the final part of Meteoron, and this should take place in September this year, is something called Interact. And Interact is the same idea but much more complex. So an astronaut, and in this case it will be Andreas Morgensen, the Danish astronaut, when he goes up for his short duration mission in September. He will, from the space station, with that joystick and the tablet, control a rover on Earth. And this rover will have two arms, which are a similar functionality to the human arm, as well as glass, uh, cameras. And Andreas will have to drive the rover, find a task board, and perform a task with just this force feedback robot. So the task might be, say, making a connector connect, or uh, opening, opening a drawer, or putting a peg in a hole. Just simple tasks to really uh, show that with force feedback, the human can make really useful tasks uh, happen with a robot from a distance. So earlier this year, he came to our lab and we, this, oh, sorry to give you <laughs> an explanation of the photos. This is the base of our robot, uh, our rover, um, four wheel drive rover. And on top of this, we will mount all the arms, all the onboard electronics and software. And he came to our lab first just to, to see what the project was all about and have some very initial training about what it feels like. And that's our lab there. So it's a, uh, it's a really interesting project, and uh, I hope you'll see some good results later this year. Thanks. Thank you, Elise. Questions? Wait, 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 wait. Right. I've got a very loud voice, you know. Um, any idea how much delay is annoying? Like, if it's 300 milliseconds a second, when does it start to be a problem? It really depends on the task that you're doing. Um, but so in currently at the moment, we work with a delay of up to about 100 milliseconds, and you can still uh, really do intuitive task performance with that. But for instance, the, the test that we do with Haptics 2, where they use the joystick to control another joystick on the ground, there'll be two different communication links, one through Russia and one through NASA. And uh, one has a delay of about 800 milliseconds, and one has a delay of two to three milliseconds. So we will really see, uh, with 800 milliseconds, it's, a, it's too much of a delay for the human to intuitively do a task. And that's where the autonomous intelligence of the robot comes into play. But about 100 milliseconds is what we, we aim for. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Hi, sorry. It is hard to yeah. see. Are you familiar with the two mathematicians, I guess, from Leiden University? who developed uh, a uh, shorter algorithm to simulate an arm. So maybe that is useful, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Um, we, do, we don't actually, I guess, concentrate on the simulation of the human arm. We do with our exoskeletons, definitely it's meant to, um, whatever forces and torques you apply at your point of rotation on your wrist, but also any movements you make with the joints in your arm, that translates directly to the robot, maybe with a, a scaling factor for safety. But um, besides that, we don't do any modeling itself of the arm because it's not necessary for us. But at the same time, it's a really interesting field, so okay. I will check it out. Thanks. <laughs> uh, there's a question here. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was quick. She's good. Is there a specific reason you chose to build an exoskeleton and not use like motion capture or two stereoscopic cameras? Um, I think an exoskeleton is in some sense, well, if you want force feedback, you have to have something that's directly attached to the human. So in this case, for instance, the robot, whatever forces and it talks it applies on its end effector is translated back to the human's wrist with a scaling factor so the robot can't hurt the human. Uh, in terms of capture, a 3D system um, is really effective, but it takes also a lot of hardware and a lot of calibration. So if you wanted someone, say, on the ISS to operate this, and we do have a vision of putting an exoskeleton on the ISS to be able to get the, the motion that way, uh, you need a lot of uh, prepared workspace. So in this sense, it's, it's just an easier operation for both the astronaut and with the feedback it's necessary. Okay, then, Thanks. thank you very much. <laughs> Round of applause.